Stephen Bowden, our chartered agronomist out of the UK. Please ignore his accent, it's totally fake. Um, you know, today what we really want to talk about is, you know, we have 1,500 clients, global clients, using our office-based program. And it has really relevant data for ergonomists in it, right? On posture, positioning, on discomfort. But we recognize that there's other things that are impacting the employees right now. And you know, the reason why we want to go through this data, which I think is really extremely relevant, not just for you in the sense of what's keeping my employees, why is the screen not moving? Yeah, oh, I bet presentation isn't on. Sorry. Is that it? There we go. It's not just, you know, what was impacting the employees two years ago, right? Getting technology out to them, making sure if Wi-Fi was working. How many people bought a you're on mute coffee mug? Uh, I changed that to bless your heart because I was getting really tired of it and I'm from the South. Um, but also understanding the two levels just above Wi-Fi that are impacting your employees. Ability to get their job done. And I know we talk presenteeism. We've talked about it for a long period. And sometimes it gets lost as a soft cost. But the reality is, is we now are in a world where we're trying to understand what's the best place for our employees to work? What's the best place for our millennials to work at? What's the best place for our aging population to work at? And what are those things that are impacting them for being able to get their job done? And I find it really interesting because it's not just that. We're now seeing a paradigm shift of EH&S being pulled into HR. So as I talk to some of my Fortune 500 companies, EH&S is becoming total worker health, total well-being. How do you help us? I don't see, oh, I do see Jeff Schmagitz in the room. Uh, he recently had a discussion with a Fortune 500 company where they asked him, how are you going to help me with the recruitment and retention? So it's not even that. It's about how do we, not only with retention, how do we understand what's pushing our employees to fatigue? What's pushing them to drop out? And how, is there low-hanging fruit in there that we can adjust or we can provide solutions to that are low cost but extremely high value? And that's really what I want to get across to you today. So. The other aspect of it is we will start deploying our data that we're mining from our 1,500 clients in the hybrid work environment. So for your ergonomists that really want to see what's happening with posture, positioning, discomfort, we're going to release that coming in January. Um, but right now, the reality is, is I really want to turn things over to Steven so he can go through this data for you because it's not just about recruitment and retention. It's not just about uh, getting them to go to hybrid working. But it's also about why are they not adopting to ergonomic programs? Why are they not accepting mindfulness programs? What, what's impeding them from doing all of this? And if we don't get those two base layers above Wi-Fi, right? And I still want to complain to Southwest Airlines because it still doesn't work. Uh, but getting those two right allows us to push them into well-being. If we don't get those two right, they're not going to adopt our programs. They're not going to adapt to them. We're not going to get compliance. And hopefully, as Stephen shows you all the information that I just went through, you'll be able to see that quite clearly. So I'm going to be quiet. I'm going to turn things over to Stephen. Stephen, the room is yours. Thank you very much, Bill. So yes, uh, good afternoon, everyone. Um, my name is Stephen. I'm a chartered economist based in the UK. And I work for a company called Morgan Maxwell. Um, a few years ago, if you're interested in this topic further, I wrote a chapter in Creating a Productive Workplace, that edition, about an ergonomics approach to well-being and productivity, just to give some more context if, if you're interested. Um, what I'm going to talk to you today about is the uh, work that we've been doing for a couple of years now. Um, what I'd be really interested in as an ergonomist, what I work across multiple industries from manufacturing, healthcare, office ergonomics, less office ergonomics now. Once you've done a few thousand office assessments, desk assessments, you uh, want to move on to other things. Uh, but um, working in companies such as Rolls-Royce, um, Formula One teams, looking at all kinds of different ergonomics issues. But I've always had an interest 
in well-being and an ergonomics approach to well-being and productivity. So what we're going to be focused on today is obviously the question that of, this, of the presentation, understanding the impact of hybrid working on well-being and productivity. Um, but there are other things that we can show you from our data that we're going to go through. Um, I'll, I'll talk about the question. So it's, it's a questionnaire uh, based on a set of well-being questions from the literature. Um, but first, before I go into the questionnaire design, and then we'll jump into the live dashboard to show you the results, what we're finding. I just wanted to sort of sort of set the scene. Um, definition of ergonomics: uh, a profession that applies theory to principles, data, and methods to design in order to optimize human well-being and overall system performance. So that's what I set out to achieve with this research. We're looking to find out what is impacting human well-being and overall system performance. I'm not just looking at um, the ergonomic chair, which I see a lot of focus on. Um, and ergonomics, as all of you guys know, is more than just the ergonomic chair. Human factors is looking at a, a systems approach. And uh, what we look to do within the research is look at um, the evidence, which I'm going to show in a minute, but looking at not just the physical well-being, but social and psychological well-being as well. How does that impact the user? How does that, the psychological and physical um, and social well-being, impact the worker from doing their best work? What are the distractions that are affecting their well-being and productivity? So if we're looking to measure well-being, we need to define it, first of all. Um, and we need to define presenteeism as well, if we're looking to measure it. I don't know if you guys would agree, but lots of organizations talk about well-being. And it can be access to a gym membership, fruit on a Thursday afternoon, or, uh, but it's not necessarily properly defined. Um, so hopefully, maybe some of you have heard of this research, but Rebecca Dodge at the University of Cardiff Metropolitan University in the UK did her PhD and, and titled The Challenge of Defining Well-Being. And she defined well-being as the balance point between an individual's resource pool and the challenges faced. And what we can see here um, is uh, someone of an optimal state of subjective well-being, where their physical, social, and psychological challenges are in balance with their physical, social, and psychological resources. What we don't want to happen, and we want to identify as early as possible within organizations, we want to understand when challenges start to outweigh resources, and especially if it's for extended periods of time. Because when this happens, what is a quite a rapid progress from healthy and present work, where we want to keep our employees, through this one-way street, all the way down to ill health, short-term absence. And this is normally the time where occupational health or HR will get involved. But with our research and hopefully the future tool, what you should be able to do is identify the areas that are stopping your colleagues doing their best work and what's affecting your colleagues from a challenges perspective so we can make interventions to keep them healthy and present at work. So bear that in mind as we look at the data, the balance point between an individual's resource pool and the challenges faced. But it ties in with, um, I hear about health and well-being being talked about a lot, but they're slightly different um, because... I can be an individual that has my well-being perfectly in balance. But from a health perspective, I'm not doing too well. I could be an individual where uh, my well-being is actually out of balance, but from a health perspective, I tick all the boxes. So what we want to make sure is that we understand the difference between those two things. And also, um, think about if we can get the, uh, our employees balanced between the resources and challenges, that gives them the ability to adapt. And that's why I like this definition from the Lancet about what, what is health. And it's the ability to adapt. So if we can reduce unnecessary distractions from the working environment, from a physical, social, and psychological environment, if we can reduce those distractions, we can give our staff the ability to adapt. For example, if they're having a bad time outside of work, if they come to work and we reduce unnecessary distractions, as you'll see some examples of in a moment, that gives them the ability to adapt. So um, that's a really important to talk, define the difference between the two. So that's defining well-being, the balance point between the individual's resources and challenges. Um, but presenteeism. Now, in the UK, the UK government defined presenteeism as coming to work when ill. I'm not sure if that's similar in the States, 
But it's more than that, I would argue. It's the other events that are stopping you doing your best work. So I just have to think about that for a second. When you're at work, what are those other events that distract you from doing your best work? Is it in an open plan office, being distracted from speech intelligibility or office noise? Is it the lighting? Is it the thermal environment? Is it relationship with your line manager? Is it the pay and benefits you receive? What is it that's distracting you from doing your best work? That's what we're looking to identify in our research. So um, it's the other events that distract one from full productivity is our sort of death. So reduced productivity at work due to health problems, okay, um, or other events that distract one from full productivity. So that's great. We've got a definition of well-being and we've got a definition of presenteeism, but how do we measure these things? Now, uh, we talked about the uh, Rebecca Dodge's work, and so we'd set upon, set upon designing a questionnaire. Um, we looked at the literature, and Rebecca Dodge, one of the sort of great bits of literature we came across, um, with, and making it clear that well-being is made up of physical, social, and psychological elements. So we uh, designed a questionnaire based on the physical, social, and psychological with questions under each of those subjects. But we also uh, looked at literature and uh, um, Petraska did some work where they looked to identify the areas of well-being that are correlated with self-reported productivity. Because as you'll see from the questionnaire design in a moment, we want the questions that we ask are inherently a productivity question based on the areas of subjective well-being. But what we see here on the left-hand side is personal well-being barriers. So outside of work, what are the main distractions? What are the main areas or subsets of well-being that are correlated with self-reported productivity? So we actually see a higher correlation with personal well-being barriers than we do with work well-being barriers, interestingly. But some examples, lack of resources, issues with co-workers, not enough time, issues with supervisors, lack of training, technical issues. So what we did, we set about of the designing our questions under the physical, social, and psychological elements of well-being. But also, as you'll see in the dashboard in a moment, we have our question sets underneath these 11 categories. So we wanted to make sure that the, we're asking the right questions. If, uh, we, we could, we could uh, have a million people in our survey. If we're not asking the right questions, it's not going about it the correct way. We need to make sure we're asking the right questions. So. Um, Basically, the, we, we designed the questionnaire and utilizing Cardenas, I work with Morgan Maxwell, partnered with Cardenas, we utilized their, uh, their, their clients. And that's one of the weaknesses in the study because obviously Cardenas do a good job in preventing musculoskeletal disorders. So that's one of the weaknesses which I'll come on into in, in, in a moment. But first thing we asked is which of, the which of the following in a normal working month is your main place of work? We want to really understand for management and for business leaders, what are, where are, what's the difference between working in the company premises, client premises, or working from home, or a combination of both? We also asked in the last month, in the past month, approximately where have you mostly been working? Mostly at home, uh, mostly on company uh, client premises, or roughly, roughly uh, even split between the two. And when working from home, um, a dedicated room or work office, a dedicated area, but not a separate room, or a non-specific house location, such as a dining room table. So we can ask those initial questions so we can compare those groups later down the line and see what's going on. Um, here's an example of the question that I was talking about. So we don't just want to ask questions um, around, for example, engagement, for example, um, are, how likely are you to recommend working for this company? I mean, that's interesting, but it's not a true driver of someone's subjective well-being or their self-reported productivity. So what we did is looked at literature, and this question is well used, uh, with, with productivity questions. Uh, during the last six months, to what extent did each comment below distract you from carrying out your best work? So that's what we're interested in. What's stopping you doing your best work? Then, we ask the specific areas of subjective well-being from the literature. So here's some examples. I won't go through them all, but personal finances. If personal finances doesn't distract you from carrying out your best work, 
you would score lower down. And if it's causing you a distraction, you would score higher up towards 10. The pay and benefits you receive, again, the same principle. Here are some other examples of questions we asked. On average, the questionnaire took about eight minutes to complete. Because um, there's a lot of surveys nowadays, people are over-surveyed. We spent a lot of time on the uh, usability as well, following Jacob Nielsen's heuristics, making sure that it's easy to use, easy to follow. So um, here's some examples. So during the last six months, to what extent did each comment below distract you from carrying out your best work? Working while feeling unwell, feelings of sadness and low mood, low level of energy, mental health concerns, carrying out tasks that are not normally part of your job, your responsibility as a carer. So there's, and there's lots of other questions that we ask covering the physical, social, and psycholo psychological elements of subjective well-being. We also, at the end of the questionnaire, ask and productivity questions. So one question we ask is over the last six months, how many days, so this is self-reported data, obviously limited in some way, uh, but still useful. Over the last six months, how many days have you been absent from work due to injury or illness? So self-reported absenteeism. Next question, over the last six months, how many days have you had to work with injury or illness? So classic sickness presenteeism. Then we also ask, over the last six months, how many days of work do you think you may have lost due to being distracted or unable to concentrate? So those other events, how many days is that costing you? And the last question we ask is of self-reported productivity. Does your workplace enable you to work productively? And we also asked some, and these, are, these weren't, um, you didn't have to, these were optional to answer these, employment type, gender, uh, your age range, and time with organisation, I need to get some glasses, you know, time with organisation. So that sets the scene for the questionnaire that we designed. We really wanted to look at the literature in detail to make sure that we were asking the right questions. That's the last thing we want to do is ask the incorrect questions. And we wanted to make sure our questions not only the key drivers of subjective well-being, but correlated with self-reported productivity as well. Do you want to mention banana mine? Oh, yes. Um, a key part of the survey, it was minimum of five, each group was a minimum of five people. Any less, than, any less than five people, we merged them into other departments. The questionnaire was just an individual link. We don't ask for any names, email addresses. So part of the remit to the university that we worked with, Dr. Neil Spencer is a professor in statistics based in the University of Hertfordshire um, and his remit was to take this data that we, we collected and analyze it, produce a tool that we can use quickly to analyze the data and make decisions about where we need to invest our time and resources as businesses. Um, so yeah, Dr. Neil spent, that was one key thing was it needs to be confidential, confidentially needs, confidentiality needs to be high on the agenda. And I did that in, in multiple ways, one of them just being an individual link. Um, so there's not, it's not an individual link per person, it's just one link that's sent out to all departments and I'm um, a minimum of five people per group. And you can go up, you can go down, but that was the five, was the number that we used. So looking at some of the results, I just want to now go into the live dashboard for you and show you Hopefully Wi-Fi doesn't let me down now. There we go. Better than my Wi-Fi at home, brilliant. Okay, so here is some of the live data that we've got from the uh, research. We, so 12 companies, um, there were 7,300 employees over those 12 companies and we got 5,000 responses. What we see, first of all here, is the summary tab. So this is the mean healthy work distraction score by question. So in ranking order, company-wide, across all of the 12 companies, the main areas of subjective well-being that are causing distraction. Let me just zoom this in slightly so you guys can have a chance of seeing it. Is that working? Right, it's too far. Okay, so what we've got here, um, company-wide. So, and we use a traffic light system. And so the traffic light system is the scoring system is zero to 10. Um, so severe distraction is more than six from zero to 10, as you can see at the bottom. 
moderate distraction is le more than three, less than or equal to six, and mild distraction is less than or equal to three. Um, so what we've got here is, in ranking order, from this data set, um, lack of sleep, quite surprised. The number one thing that's causing distractions for people doing their best work, lack of sleep. Um, low level of energy, number two, excessive email. I've heard low hanging fruit talked about quite a lot recently. Low hanging fruit, instead of these multi-million pound health plans, maybe just uh, stop copying people into their emails and let them focus on their jobs, stop distracting them. Um, interruptions from people, who's ever had that in the office? When you're high levels of concentration and someone taps you on the back, that knocks you off your concentration, doesn't it? It can take up to 25 minutes to get back up to that level of concentration that you were at. So you do not want to be distracting people. When I used to do some work at Google in Victoria in London, their engineers used to have red headsets on. And the deal was, if you've got a red headset on, you're dialed in. No, do not distract me. Very, very important. So interruptions from people, sadness and low mood, carrying out tasks that you think should have been done differently, level of motivation. So they're the sort of top seven. And what we recommend for, for clients to do is really just pick on the sort of the top five and try to make some inroads. But you can also see where the companies are doing well. Um, so we see off the chair, or I'll do ergonomics, but the chair in this data set is right down here. That could have been due to the clients that we were asking the questions. So there are some limitations to this. What we see in the right-hand corner is what we call the healthy work and distraction score. So this is like a, a benchmark for companies to work to and look to improve. So this, the idea is to do the questionnaire once and, and then redo it, to look to have a constant on this distraction score. Now, we can s slice this data. So at the moment, we're seeing this by we've seen this company-wide, but we can also look at by department, for example, so support. Out of all the departments that we had, support was the highest score. So if I was trying to implement a well-being program, we want to be focusing on the areas of highest distraction first, instead of having a one-size-fits-all approach. But the, the title of this, obviously, this uh, presentation is about the hybrid working. So before I go into the work location, we, you can have, we also, you can look at um, age, for example, which I wanted to show you. Interestingly, if you look at the age from a distraction level perspective, 20 to 29 year olds. As we get older, it seems that the distraction score is coming down somewhat. There's a bit of an outlier at the 70 year old and prefer not to disclose your age is quite high, which was quite interesting. But we've got 20 to 29 year olds having a much sort of worse time of it, uh, low level of energy, pay and benefits, lack of sense of purpose, lack of job satisfaction, lack of sleep. So age range was an interesting one, but I'm going to focus on work location for you because that's the purpose of this talk. So what we see here um, is uh, three different distractions or well-being distraction scores. We've got uh, working from home at a two. So interestingly, the lowest out of 5,000 employees, the lowest distraction score was working from home, followed by hybrid. So a combination of working in the office and at home with the number with the highest distraction being the company office. And there's different well-being distractions that each of these different groups are having. So again, having good data to make the right decisions based on where people work, instead of having one size fits all, could be a useful approach. Now, as I go through the dashboard, you'll be able to, we'll, I'll show you a comparison of these, these groups in a spider diagram, which is a little bit easier to consume. Um, so now we can look at it from a well-being category perspective. So here we go. Here's the spider diagram comparing, um, first of all, we'll start off working from home. Working from home is in blue. And the uh, average from the uh, company premises and, and hybrid is in green. So what we see here are the 11 areas, the 11 well-being categories that I mentioned from the research that are correlated with self-reported productivity. And then what we did, we put our questions under each category. So this is a quite an interesting way of looking at the information. So let's look at company premises, for example. Comparing company premises to working from home and the hybrid model. So we can see straight away there's some, uh, there's some 
areas that are sort of outliers here. So we've got financial well-being, and benefits and personal finances made up that category. Um, lack of resources was inadequate health and safety provision. But mate, there's only one question in that specific well-being category. Technical issues, temperature, noise, Wi-Fi connectivity, lack of daylight, all the way down, there's a few other options there, a few other questions that made up that category. Technical issues, we can see when working in the office, the subjective feeling from a well-being perspective, that's causing more distractions than working from home. While that is, we need to do further investigations from a contextual perspective. Um, personal issues, what's going on there? Level of motivation, lack of job satisfaction, are all increased when working in the office. And so there's lots of ways of looking at that data. Um, so that's a useful comparison for work location. Also, what we did was to um, create a heat map where we can, depending on the work location, not only look at the 11 well-being categories that we talked about in the literature, but there are all of these other variables that can impact on the individual score. So what this is, this chart shows the potential impact on the healthy work and distraction score on the right hand side here. So addressing issues within each well-being category for different subgroups down the left hand side here. So employment type, most common work location in the last month, gender, work setting, all examples of the um, different subgroups, taking into account the number of individuals in the subgroup. Now that's really important. If you've got a group, uh, a group of people in one department of 100 compared to a group of people of five in one department, we want to be looking at the group of people with a larger number. So we're going to have more impact on the overall performance of the business there. So it takes that into account as well. But it also looks at, for the category employment type full-time, um, for the subject of health and wellness, health and wellness, we could potentially reduce the distraction score by 0.237 um, if we focus on that specific category. Then we can look at this for company premises. We can see we've got slightly higher scores here and it's saying the health and wellness as well for the company premises and then for the hybrid model we've got a similar result uh, it's a slightly different result for the hybrid model we've got depressed stressed well-being category for the hybrid model so it allows you to just focus in on on your results and gives more context to the the results and the data um, one area i really wanted to show you where with the, from a statistics perspective that was really useful the more i look at the data the more i realize this is how interesting and useful this is. So we're now, because we're focusing on work location, what we're seeing here is the classifier levels, and the classifier levels are departments, work location, work type setting, employment type gender, age range, and time of organization, and the, all of the individual questions. So what this is showing us here, this chart shows if the selected question differs between classifier levels. So it's not telling us which is the highest distraction score, it's looking for differences between those departments, between those work locations. So the, distri the distribution of responses for each classifier levels are displayed. And when approximate confidence intervals are shown, the confidence interval is a little, these little blue lines, classifier levels whose intervals do not overlap can be regarded as having differences that are more than just random fluctuations. Okay, so work location, what we saw is lighting for the hybrid and company premises, and it wasn't just random fluctuations in the data, was causing more of a distraction than when working from home. Interesting. Um, daily commute, we probably guessed that one, how that would be. When working from home, you're not gonna be much distracted unless you've gotta navigate your way through the children to your office, maybe. That could be, that's probably my main distraction when working from home. Um, toilet facilities, I was surprised by that one. Uh, yeah. We like going to the toilet more in our own home. Um, understandably, I guess, although these toilets here are quite nice, I have to say. Fresh air ventilation, we see this a lot in contextual inquiries, in office environments. Nearly impossible to get it right. Thermal environment, fresh air ventilation. Hold your hand up if you've been in any office in the world where you're comfortable, or you can make everyone comfortable. Nearly impossible. But it's much easier to maybe potentially regulate when working from home. And remember, we've got those 95% confidence intervals here. This isn't happened just, this isn't random fluctuation. There's something going on here that potentially can give us some 
more nuanced uh, results. Um, I won't go through them all. Noise, I thought was interesting. Noise. Put your hand up if you get distracted by your colleagues when working in the uh, open plan office. Yeah, a few of you. Um, headphones to get around it. Um, or the no noisy office is sometimes better than a quiet office, isn't it? If you've got lots of background noise. So noise was quite interesting. We can see a difference between company premises, hybrid, and working from home. Um, so you can go through all of the results here. Um, one thing I found that was interesting, uh, responsibility as a carer was a, a key area of a subject for personal well-being that's correlated with self-reported productivity, the ability to care for people, uh, family members potentially. Um, a couple more examples, then I'll, I'll move on to the next one. Thinking about leaving the organisation. Not a massive difference between these departments, um, but interesting nonetheless. So we're finding some interesting results here. Uh, again, work, working from home seems to be outperforming in this small data set, albeit, yes, um, but it's seen, and we need to do further work, as I'll talk about the limitations of the study at the end. Um, but uh, it seems to be indicating that working from home is doing quite well across all of the areas of subjective well-being. Now, and the numeric uh, response breakdown, um, what this is looking at is questions I didn't show you in the questionnaire, just for time purposes, but we are, I'll show you some examples. But uh, we asked days absence due to illness or injury, exercise, working productively, healthy diet, days lost to distraction, and days working with injury or illness. So what we see here, we're going to go to work location. We see the, interestingly, um, when working from home, people are spending more time working from home with injury or illness than they are in the office. Interesting. Um, especially if you're a manager making a decision on where are we going to put our workforce. Healthy diet. There's a definite difference there. We see that with the confidence interval when working from home, that feeling of being able to have more control of what you eat. Maybe it could be a cost element as well. Working productively. This went from zero low uh, productivity to 10 high productivity. We're seeing, again, um, company premises losing to working from home and the hybrid working environment, albeit not a massive difference, but still a slight uptick there, and the confidence intervals are, are not crossing over. Um, we've got uh, days absence due to illness or injury. Not a big difference in those results. So that was quite interesting. So what we wanted to do there is to provide a bit more nuance to some of the results um, using that statistical analysis and the power of this, uh, this tool. Uh, one thing I wanted to show you before I moved on is the age, because I quite found this quite fascinating, looking at age um, and what the main, and again, it comes to that younger age group we were seeing that are really struggling in this specific population, this, this 5,000 individuals. It seems to me that it seems the data showing that 20 to 29 year old group are causing some of the highest scores. So you can see their days working with illness or injury, um, exercise, 70 plus, interestingly. Um, I wanted to go back to this one as it goes. Uh, so we go to work location here and, um, oh, sorry, age. This was quite interesting. The number one difference, the biggest difference for age range was pay and benefits, which was quite interesting for the 20 to 29 year old group. Then dislike of your job again, 20 to 29 year old group scoring higher there. Thinking about leaving the organization. If you've got a number of young employees within a business, do we want to be focusing our well-being program on the 40 to 49 year old group? Or do we want to target that smaller group at the start? Having some useful data like this can help with that argument. So, um, also from a visualization perspective, just comparing, again, just to focus on the purpose of this presentation is to compare the hybrid working situation with working in the office. And we can see here the um, combination of working from home and working elsewhere compared to company premises in red to compared to working from home. Um, so you can see there's some definitely some differences and a big differences between some of these areas, so especially technical issues. So we can click on technical issues and we can see when um, 
working from the company premises and combination of working from home and working elsewhere, we can see in the black and the, and the pink some really high scores there. So again, some really interesting information showing that in this data set, 5,000 people, albeit small, over 12 companies, we are seeing some um, performance gains from well-being and self-reported productivity from working from homes. So um, just wrapping up, um, I'm going to jump back to the slides just to summarize where we, where we are and some of our findings. So what we had here um, to finish up was the different distraction scores. We had um, the company premises, so going from 0 to 10, company premises at a 3, followed by the hybrid model at 2.8 and working from home at 2. And, the bigger, and then here's the differences on those, on those areas of well-being that are correlated with self-reported productivity. So it just, the purpose of this uh, research really is just to try to produce data that's useful for businesses. Deloitte did a report in 2018 saying that business leaders, chief execs and FDs, want more hard data to make decisions instead of just opinion. Let's have some data so we can decide where we focus our interventions and hopefully we're moving to that on, on that journey to provide more information to clients based on the subjective well-being of their staff. So I hope you found that interesting. I need to share the slides again so you can have access to them. I'll get, I'll get them to the organizers so you can download them. Um, yeah, if you guys have got any questions or thoughts, I'll be happy to do my best to answer them. Thank you. Yes, so um, summary, detailed results, question breakdown, um, discomfort. Yes, we looked at discomfort, didn't we? Um, where are we? Discomfort or pain? Uh, age rate, so where, where, how do you want? Oh, by work location, yes, yes. Discomfort or pain by work location. Here, this was interesting. I should have really shown you this, being a lot of you interested in ergonomics. This is baffling. What's going on here? Are people moving more at home? Are they more sedentary in the office? Yep. I think in my journey, and it's a very good question, my journey in ergonomics, I do see too many people focusing on this perfect posture. I don't know if any of you saw Joanne Vernacos a few years ago. Um, she wrote books called Sitting Kills, Moving Heels. Um, she was the ex-NASA scientist studying the effects of zero gravity on astronauts. And she was asked what her favorite chair was. And she said a wooden bench was her favorite chair. So what are you going to do? You're going to move. Movement's key. So I don't know why this is happening, but it's interesting. And we've got the confidence interval to show this hasn't happened. This isn't just a random fluctuation. So what is it? What's going on? We all a lot of focus during the early stages of the pandemic was the physical ergonomics. But, there, but as we're seeing in the data, there are other things that we could be focusing on, not just the physical ergonomics. Is, and that's one of the limitations of this, of this study, I have to say, because the client base of Cardinus, they sell ergonomics DSC software. So you would hope it shows the software is doing its job. You would hope that that would be a low score. Um, so as we start to get more people in, the, in, in this data set that don't have access to ergonomic software, we may see that creeping up. That's definitely one of the limitations, but albeit interesting. So there's, you can look at the data in, in multiple ways. Um, yeah, so that was enough. Thanks very much. Uh, any other thoughts or questions? Yes, sir? Yeah. Agreed. It's a very, very good question. And there is a limit, it is limited to self-reported data. 
Um, I know Microsoft have got lots of evidence on the output of individuals using the Outlook and Microsoft Teams, and they're making the argument, Microsoft at the moment, that their staff are more productive when in the office as opposed to when home. But there's more to productivity and well-being than using Microsoft products. There's other things that go on in the world that can affect your well-being. So, and, and this approach to well-being is a snapshot. How do you feel right this, at this second? What's your, your lot in life, so to speak? How do you feel about your lot in life? So yeah, it, it's a very good point. Um, and there is data showing that, that collaboration is absolutely fundamental. So I think there definitely needs to be a balance here. Um, and we're seeing that the hybrid model is not far behind the, comp the working from home. And it's more spe less, less of a distraction from a well-being perspective than purely company office on its own. So I, I would agree. And I, as we start to get more people in the data set, maybe we, we start to see that. But self-reported data, yes. Also, what we're doing is we're looking to, um, we're measuring cost per person per hour at the start. Um, and we, what we're hopefully going to look to see is as the distraction score goes up, the cost per person per hour should go up as well. So once we've done it enough times, we can then hopefully be predictive. And then business leaders can do one survey, and then we can give some form of insight as to how much productivity gains they can get, not just self-reported data, actually based on real dollars and cents or pounds and pence data. But that, that's sort of the next stage, what we're working on. But that's a very, it's a very good question. Um, the collaboration is definitely a vital element. Any other thoughts or questions? Yes, please. Very, very good question. And um, what we see sometimes is uh, HR have a slight pushback. They're scared of asking the questions sometimes, and they don't want to sort of open a can of worms. But um, once you get past that uh, and explain the benefits of it, um, what we're seeing is businesses work. We've done a few bef uh, uh, before and after, and we're seeing a drop in distraction score by focusing on low-hanging fruit, lack of sleep. We've produced some guidance that can go to management in individual departments to give advice. Um, as we saw, we saw email, interruptions from people, being sort of the top in the top three distractions. Again, some good communication and working with the local managers is key in each individual department, telling those individual managers what the key issues are from a well-being and productivity perspective. That's what we're seeing is the, is the rollout. But there, there, there is definitely pushback with having the knowledge and expertise to fix the problems. Um, some companies are yeah, great, they can take it and run with it, but there's other companies that are a bit scared from the results of, like, and they're not sure what to do with the results. So I think there's some hand-holding there or some further consultancy that's required on some occasions. But yes, the, the low-hanging fruit is what we recommend to work on as early as possible. Sleep, distractions, email, all relatively easy things to fix. So yes, they are putting into place some intervention slowly. But it's, a, it's, it's not an easy task, and change, especially the larger organizations changing culture. As you all know, it's not the easiest thing to do. Yes? UK and US, they were split between. Yep. Um, I, haven't, I haven't looked at that data yet. That's a very good question. I th that maybe would have caused some problems, maybe. <laughs> I, I would have been on the losing side there, though, wouldn't I, looking at the... Um, no, but we haven't compared it to, but it's something we could potentially do. Uh, I'm not, uh, maybe that would be useful. I don't know. Is there, is there a good, good question. Well, no, but thanks very much. I'm here all, all conference if you want to chat about the results. Thank you.